Well, good morning. Uh, I have uh, actually uh, no slide, but I have no disclosures to make as well in today's talk. Um, I am going to be talking to you a little bit this morning about sort of some technical and technique related uh, uh, methods and, 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 and devices and so forth that might improve um, your ability to successfully provide epidural analgesia. I'm, I'm not certainly going to talk about everything. You've already heard this morning about continuous spinal anesthesia from Dr. Palmer. Uh, later today, you'll hear about timed intermittent or intermittent bolus uh, uh, techniques uh, for epidural analgesia from Dr. Rollins. And, um, uh, you'll hear from Lawrence Sen later on about troubleshooting an already poorly functioning catheter, and tomorrow there'll be a nice debate about the continuous, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, about the uh, combined spinal epidural technique versus epidural. I'll leave all that alone. Uh, instead, I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about some generic epidural related techniques that might improve your practice. All right. So let's begin with the premise that as good as we are, and I'm sure you're all really good at this. Uh, it, regional anesthesia for, for labor is not perfect. This is one of my favorite slides. I promise it's not photoshopped. Uh, this is a picture of a woman's back, and the tattoo there says nobody's perfect. And if you look underneath it, there are clearly three different <laughs> epidural po entry points. <clears throat> but epidural analgesia, we, we, but it is pretty good. Uh, these are uh, results from two series from uh, uh, quite a while ago now, com coming up on, on uh, 15 or even more years ago, to, close to 20 years ago. Um, one is, was from uh, uh, my previous group at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, a manual review of about 4,400 uh, epidurals uh, provided for labor, and there was 98% overall patient satisfaction with the technique. And uh, in my institution that I'll be starting at in two weeks at uh, Wake Forest University, uh, Peter Pan and colleagues found a similar rate of success, 98.8% in a much larger trial. What's interesting, though, is that although our patients were eventually comfortable and happy with what we did, quite a few times they weren't happy at the beginning. Uh, so in our study at Brigham and Women's, uh, the epidural catheter replacement rate was between 9.4 and 13.6 percent, depending on particularly which technique was being used. Um, and in the PAN study, um, very similar rates of failure were, were uh, observed. So this was over 12,000 anesthetics observed um, in the early 2000s. Um, you see the overall failure rates of 10 to 14 percent, depending on which technique was being used. About half of those were intravascular catheters and most of the other half were inadequate analgesia, um, and in many cases, um, inadequate enough that the catheter had to be replaced. Um, so you might argue, well, things have gotten better since the early 2000s, and those were both big teaching hospitals, so maybe it's different. So here's two um, more recent reports. Uh, Agaram, uh, reporting out of BC Women's in Vancouver, Canada, was 209 patients that they prospectively followed for failure rate of the initial epidural placement, and about uh, uh, two-thirds of them were done by attending anesthesiologists, and they still had a 16.9 percent failure rate. And Fangamuthu uh, in um, Hull in the United uh, Kingdom uh, reviewed about 1,500 patients for failure, which they defined as discomfort after 45 minutes. Um, there it was more trainees and junior uh, uh, practitioners, registrars, and senior registrars, and they had a 14.7% failure rate. These are similar to the numbers that were reported in the earlier studies, and I think maybe the message is, is let the trainee do it. It's a little better in, um, in that group. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a few ideas uh, to try to work with this. Uh, there really is a signal that we can still work with when 10 to 15 percent or even more of our epidurals are not perfect at the very beginning. And I'm going to talk about very briefly these six things, how to position the patient, how to find the right spot to put the needle in, a couple of words about actually numbing up the skin before you start, some techniques and potential uh, future ideas about finding uh, when, when you're actually in the epidural space. Um, uh, and then a quick word towards the end about which kind of catheter you use and avoiding putting it into a blood vessel. So positioning. We don't have an audience response system. Can I do a poor man's one? Raise your hand if you most or almost always use the sitting position. And hands down, lateral position. About 10% at the most. And who kind of mixes it up and does just whatever feels right? Almost none of you, a very few hands. Good, you're, you're like the rest of the world. Um, when I was growing up, we did them all lateral, and we only sat people up if we were having trouble, and now things have changed. Um, so the question is, is that 
right? Is that what we should be doing? So one of the arguments for considering the lateral position, and we heard a bit about that earlier this morning in, in scoliosis patients, but one of the other ideas is that the blood vessels in the epidural space being valveless are decompressed in the lateral position, whereas they're engorged in the sitting position due to hydrostatic pressure. So maybe you'll have fewer epidural uh, intravascular placements um, or bloody taps um, with spinal needles if you do it in the lateral position. There's also a suggestion that women are happier or more satisfied in the lateral position uh, than they are in the sitting position. So let's take a closer look at that. There are, in fact, two studies um, from the early 2000s that suggested that there were fewer intravascular placements if you used the lateral versus sitting position. So Harney randomized about 200 patients to sitting or lateral and found the intravascular placement to be about 15.7% versus 3.7%, a big difference. Um, when you did it in the lateral position. And Bahar, uh, in, a, in a larger study, actually randomized to sitting lateral or lateral with the head down to further uh, decompress the blood vessels. And they saw a progressive decrease in intravascular placements from 10.7 to 6 to 2%. However, all of these studies used older style nylon catheters, not the very popular wire-wrapped polyurethane catheters that I suspect many of us are using these days. And as we'll see at the end of the talk, there are other methods that are at least as effective as the lateral position. This idea about patient comfort has actually been systematically studied, but it's been a little while. Um, in non-pregnant patients, there's clearly more vagal symptoms and other nonspecific symptoms if you're sitting up, and some of you may have seen this. Um, in your non-pregnant patients. But in pregnant patients who are generally otherwise healthy, that's not usually a big deal. Interestingly, whether or not patients are more comfortable in the sitting or lateral position turns out to depend on a couple of things, the most important of which is how big they are. So a big study uh, by Vincent and Chestnut back from the early 1990s um, asked women to assume both positions for 60 seconds prior to actual epidural placement, some when labor, some were prior to labor, and they asked them to rate their comfort um, in, in each position. And it turns out that if you're lean, if your body mass index was less than 25, shown in the black bars here, you tended to prefer the lateral position. Um, if you were overweight, BMI between 25 and 30, it was mixed. It was sort of no clear preference. And if you were obese, BMI greater than 30, there was a strong preference for the sitting position. Now, this was 1991. Not everybody was obese in 1991. But in 2015, 50% uh, of our patients are overweight, 30% are obese, and that's growing. Um, so I don't think we can assume that the lateral position is always going to be more comfortable um, in, in, in the current modern era. Um, why should you consider being good at lateral position? Well, um, certainly in emergency cases, you may not be able to sit up the patients in cases, say, of cord prolapse or so forth. So being facile at the lateral position in elective situations probably is a good idea. Um, in patients who are really having a trouble with positioning, patient movement is decreased because they can't move in the direction of the bed. So there's only sort of one axis about which they can move. Um, and at least there's been a suggestion that if you're good at the lateral position, it's easy to go to sitting, but the converse is isn't always true. So it may be true, just like the talk we just heard about general anesthesia, that in elective situations, we ought to get some facility with the lateral position, even if you, like the majority here, are fans of the sitting position. Finding the optimal point of entry of our needle. So the first thing to note is we're really, really bad at this. We think we're good at it, but we're not. Um, most of us use the line connecting the iliac crest, Touffier's line, and use that and assume that, at least according to the literature, that that's L4-5 or maybe the body of L4. Um, what's important is Touffier's line is a radiographic finding. It is not a palpation finding. And in fact, because of all the soft tissue that overlies it and maybe the physiologic changes of pregnancy, um, the palpated line is often not where we think it is. Imaging studies show that it's poorly correlated with the radiographic finding. This is one of my favorite studies about this. This is a study by Broadbent back in 2000. They asked a bunch of anesthesiologists to mark an interspace, anyone they wanted in the lumbar area. And they did it in one position, sitting or lateral. And then they had a second anesthesiologist say what space was marked in the other position. The anesthesiologist only agreed about 60% of the time. Um, that's not actually the finding. The finding is interesting is they then put an oil-filled capsule over the mark and then did MRIs so you could see the little ball there outside the spine. And as it turns out, um, the anesthesiologist's opinions across the horizontal axis and the actual levels um, uh, across the vertical axis here uh, were not well aligned. This line right here would basically be when we were right. 
uh, when, we, when the level was the same one that we thought it was. And we, we got it right 29% of the time, right? It's not very good. Um, what's scary is most of the errors are here. That is, we are higher than we think we are. And in some cases, like if you look under the anesthetist opinion L34, on some of the cases, they were in the thoracic area, even though they thought they were in L34. And that's just by regular, ordinary palpating landmarks. And these were very skilled anesthesiologists. A similar result came from ultrasound findings. This is um, out of a, a Jose Carvalho's group in Canada. Um, here, one anesthesiologist palpated the crests and marked where they were, and then they hid those with big bandages. And then they had somebody else come with an ultrasound probe and identify where what, what, where the, uh, the spines were and marked them out. And then they connected the lines after the drapes were down and said, where was the palpated line? So everybody thought it was supposed to be L4-5, but 100% of the time, the actual inner space was higher than L4-5. 91% um, of the time, it was higher than L3-4. And 35% of the time, it was higher than L2-3. Um, so we're generally higher than we think we are, is the lesson here. And I think the take home lesson is you might want to go to the lowest good feeling inner space you can feel. Um, ultrasound does probably improve our ability to identify the, the proper space. And I'm not going to review ultrasound in detail. That's a, a talk or even a whole weekend on its own. Um, but it does look like it works. Um, just a quick show of hands again. Do any of you routinely use ultrasound? All right, yeah. A few, a few. All right, well, it may catch on, just like it did for central lines and, and for regional blocks. But right now, I think it's a minority of us in the, um, in the obstetric area. Um, this is a meta-analysis of a number of trials, none of which by themselves looked very impressive, but the overall effect is the diamond at the bottom here, which favored ultrasound by about um, a 50% reduction in technical failure and about one fewer attempts at actually identifying the epidural space. Um, so it works, but it's still not a real-time technique. Um, except in research processes. So you still have to image and then do the thing you normally do with loss of resistance. And it's still not routinely employed, both in this room and elsewhere. Even though the UK's uh, Quality Institute recommended its routine use in 2008, less than 10% of British anesthesiologists felt comfortable doing so. OK, anesthetizing the skin. Talk briefly about what you say and what you use. What you say, here's a quote from the Buddha, words have the power uh, both to destroy and to heal. Uh, when words are both true and kind, they can change the world. So what am I talking about? Well, what I'm talking about is what words you say before you anesthetize the skin can change the patient's experience. This is a study out of Brigham and Women's by Dick Verelman and colleagues, where they randomized 140 patients having either labor epidurals or spinals for elective sections. And with a waiver of informed consent, they said one of two things to the patient before anesthetizing the skin. They either said, you're going to feel a big beat big sting and burn in your back like a big bee sting, and this is the worst part of the procedure. Now face it, some of you have used words just like that, right? Big bee sting seems to be what we think. Um, and or they said, we're going to inject a local anesthesia that will numb the area where we're going to do the epidural or the spinal, and you will be comfortable during the procedure. Um, interestingly, they got a big difference in the VAS score for what the injection felt like. Um, on the left is labor epidurals, on the right is cesareans. And you can see the placebo group, that's the kind words, had a lower VAS than the nocebo group on, on the right, that's the less kind words. Um, and uh, it, it, this was true in both cases. Now, I have one objection to this study, and that is the anesthesiologist both said the words and did the procedure. And I, I don't think you can rule out that they subtly changed their techniques if they were using the mean words. I'd love to do the study with headphones and nobody knows what was said. Um, but it is suggestive, and it seems to be a very harmless thing to do is use kind words. Don't tell them it's going to hurt. Tell them this is going to make you comfortable. What you use. Um, most of us know that if you bicarbonate local anesthetics, it hurts less. I bet you few of you take the trouble to do so in the middle of a labor epidural because there isn't bicarbonate in the tray. It's a separate step. It's extra money, all that good stuff. But it does reduce the VAS score for injection pain from 3.6 to 2.6, that in a randomized trial by Brendan Carvalho and colleagues at Stanford. Um, interestingly, and this was counterintuitive to me because I was always told that epinephrine-containing solutions hurt more. Uh, because presumably because of the low pH. Turns out in, in labor epidurals that may not be true and it may reduce your bleeding. So again in this randomized trial they got lidocaine with or without epi and with or without bicarb. Superficial bleeding at the site was reduced from 40% to 10% to no bleeding at all which was a highly significant difference when they added epi but it didn't increase the VAS score. 
So unlike the situation in anesthetizing the skin, say, for an IV, adding epi, and it's in all your trays as the test does, may be a nice way to reduce some of that pesky bleeding at the skin site. Identifying the epidural space. So the loss of resistance technique that I suspect essentially everyone in the room uses was um, first described nearly a century ago. Um, but as we've seen, the primary failure rate of this technique remains in the 15 to 20 percent range. And so I'm going to discuss a few possible improvements um, in our technique that might make things um, a bit better. Um, so we'll talk about the medium you use for loss of resistance, air versus saline. Um, we'll talk about some new devices that um, replace your thumb with a device to detect when you've actually had the loss of resistance. And then we'll talk about some kind of pie in the sky ideas for confirming that the tip of the epidural needle is in the epidural space. So first, air or saline. Um, I think probably as much as the world is divided into lateral and sitting, the world is divided into air and saline people. One more time, who's a, who's, who's a saline every time? And who's air most of the time? And who mixes it up, I don't care. OK, you're just like the rest of the world, too. Um, so you know, the air people think saline is dangerous and like the perfect storm, and the saline people think air is dangerous like the tornado. And the fact of the matter is, you're probably both wrong. Um, so some have argued recently that saline is better. Uh, they've argued this because of some case reports and really lousy randomized trials that suggested that there was more um, incomplete analgesia um, more difficulty passing the catheter once you identify the epidural space, more paresthesias, headaches, and some rare complications like intrathecal air. Um, but the studies done on this are terrible. Um, the retrospective studies that have been done showed no difference. Uh, our group did one of those. And recently, there's been a meta-analysis of those studies, uh, five trials of generally poor quality, four of which were done in OB, about 4,400 patients, found no differences in partial block difficult catheter insertion, paresthesias, intravascular placements, accidental dural puncture, or headache. No differences. A trial that came out specifically in the combined spinal epidural technique, which might be a little different, right, because maybe saline could be confused with CSF. Now, it's been suggested somewhat in the retrospective literature. They've also found no difference, no difference in CSEs. Um, so why is this even in my talk? Well, there is a finding that I think I want to share with you, and this came out of some retrospective study that I did with um, my colleague Katie Arndt, who's now at Mayo Clinic. We looked retrospectively at about 1,000 epidurals in two one-month periods at Brigham and Women's, and it turned out that we were sort of in the midst of people kind of going from air all the time to saline all the time because the kit changed and had saline in it. Um, and about half the epidurals were done with air, and about half were done with saline. We used fairly standard bupivacaine fentanyl um, regimens afterwards. And we looked at the incidence of comfort, asymmetric block, catheter replacement, postural puncture headache, no differences across the board, no differences across the board. But what we did find was just like the, all of you in this audience, people had a preference. Um, and so we arbitrarily defining, defined having a strong preference as you did more than 70% of your cases in one technique or the other. Um, there were a few people who were ambivalent, but 82% of the various people who did the uh, epidurals in this study um, had a strong preference. Some were sailing people, some were air people. Um, it turns out that if you use your preferred medium instead of the other one, um, you do better. Uh, there are fewer attempts, fewer paresthesias, um, and significantly fewer unintentional dural punctures, all significant differences. Now, since most of you have a strong preference, you probably don't switch all the time. But when this sometimes occurs, if you work in any sort of a teaching institution or if you're asked to help a colleague, I think our natural inclination is to help with whatever they've been doing, I'll do too. And you probably shouldn't do that. You should probably go to what you're comfortable with, start over if you have to. If you're a saline person, draw it up. And if you're an air person, squirt it out. But use what you're comfortable with, I think, is the lesson here. It might be an argument, again, for in elective situations, using the other technique so that you're facile with both. Automatic detection of the loss of resistance. Most of us, of course, don't do that. We use our thumb, and we do one of two things. Either we advance the needle with two hands and then check, 
and then advance again and then check and advance again and check. Or we keep one hand on the needle, one hand on the syringe, and we're checking all the time but advancing the needle with one hand. They each have their proponents. On the one hand, the two hand intermittent check people would say, hey, I've got more control over the needle and an unsedated patient is moving around and I've got careful control of movement of the needle, but conversely, maybe I could go past the epidural space and get a wet tap. Conversely, the continuous uh, people, the Bromage uh, style technique will, will argue, well, I'm, I'm always checking so I won't miss the epidural space, but the other argument is, yeah, but it's really hard to move with one hand, it's awkward hand position and so forth. So the question is, can we have it both ways? And there's some devices that purport to let you do that. Um, they replace your thumb with a device that gives you a visual rather than tactile endpoint um, and lets you have two uh, hands on the needle all the time. So one of them is the EpiSure Auto Detect Syringe. Um, this is a commercially available product that has a spring in the syringe. It's calibrated only for saline, so you air folks are out of luck. Um, you, you put this on the end of the needle and it will collapse on its own when you enter the epidural space. The other device for you air people, and I'm one of you by the way, uh, is uh, the EpiDrum. You can see that this is a device that's only for air and if you look carefully you see a little uh, kind of cellophane bubble uh, there uh, on, on the end of the epidural needle and when you enter the epidural space it collapses like that. These devices are both commercially available. Um, do they work? Well, um, an early comparative study by Habib at Duke uh, looked at the EpiSure device and found failure rates were degrees from 3% to 0%. Keep in mind though, they were fans of this thing and they weren't blinded and so these studies are hard to interpret. Um, there was a tiny reduction in the time it took to find the epidural space. Um, there seemed to be a reduction in both dural punctures and the number of attempts. Um, a larger study done at Brigham and Women's by Jeannie Carabuena and colleagues um, found insignificant differences in overall block success and in the training curves by operator using the cumulative sum or QSUM scores. They found a significant difference in time, but it was only five seconds. Um, so it's not clear that this is a game changer, but it works a little. Um, Epidrum, there's two studies, uh, both very small studies, again, obviously unblinded, that found fewer attempts, shorter times to identify the space, and the anesthesiologist liked it. Um, one purported advantage of a technique like this is that you may be able to do real-time ultrasound. Uh, here's somebody holding a, uh, a probe with one hand and using the epidrum device and the needle on the other hand. So this will be a one operator continuous ultrasound possibility. Now, this is getting into sort of blue sky in the future, but I thought it would be fun just to take a quick look at it. So, one other idea is to say, gosh, I wish I knew where the tip of my needle was. I know what it feels like, but it sure would be nice to know where it is. And there's two ideas to actually identify the contents of the epidural space in real time by the tip of the needle. So one idea, shown here by Jim Rathmel's group at uh, Mass General Hospital in Boston, is to put optical fibers at the end of the epidural needle that emit and look at the reflected light, and by the spectrum that they see, they can tell kind of a little bit about where they are. So if you look on the left, you can see CT images of the needle moving moving towards the spine. Um, and on the far right of the slide, you see how much blood and how much lipid is being detected. So when you're in muscle, the top row, it's mostly blood, not very much lipid. When you're in the ligamentum flavum, it's like 50-50. And when you're in the epidural space, it's mostly lipid. And we know that there's a lot of lipids in the epidural space. So this is kind of cool. Clearly not a commercial device. But then again, who would have known that we did all our blocks under ultrasound without uh, looking for paresthesias 25 years ago? <coughs> Um, here's another one. This is an epidural needle that has an ultrasound that has a, uh, uh, an ultrasound uh, emitter and detector in the tip of the needle. Um, the red solid arrow is the um, uh, the dura mater, and the dotted line is the ligamentum flavum. So the space between them, shown by the letter A in the top there, is the uh, is the epidural space. And you can see as you move the needle forward, going from the top to the bottom, you can see when you've actually entered the epidural space and the third and fourth slide. So again, pie in the sky, maybe for the future. Catheter selection. Um, this is, we're getting near the very end here. Most of the data favors the use of soft wire reinforced polyurethane catheters over the nylon catheters and certainly over the stiff styleted nylon catheters that if you are of a certain age, uh, as I am, uh, you grew up using. 
Um, most of the data also favors multi-orifice over single orifice catheters. So what we're talking about here on the lower left of the slide is a traditional nylon catheter. Um, <clears throat> on the upper right is one of the wire reinforced polyurethane catheters. And multi-hold catheters, particularly during bolus injections, might allow better spread of the local anesthetic solution. I should caution you that during infusions, during ordinary infusions, not during, a, say, a PCA bolus or a manual bolus, all the drug comes out the proximal hole. So they're basically uh, one-hold catheters during infusions. But during boluses, and we're going to hear more about boluses soon, um, multi-hold catheters may provide an advantage. Um, there is, uh, I think, a previously unreported difficulty in using those polyurethane catheters. Hans Figum and colleagues at the Brigham uh, looked at 2,100 epidurals and found that there was a 4.5% rate of failure to be able to advance the catheter despite very high confidence, 9 out of 10, in the loss of resistance, meaning everybody was sure they were there, but they couldn't advance the catheter 1 in 20 times. They found that injection of saline or simply repositioning the needle to get a, uh, a different try at it were the best responses to it. But importantly, and I wanted to highlight this, it almost tripled the dural puncture rate if you persisted uh, when it was hard to pass the catheter. So it is a warning sign that the tip of your needle is not optimally placed if it's hard to pass one of these soft catheters. Finally, avoiding intravascular placement. Um, we talked a little bit about lateral versus sitting position, and that works. Um, this is actually a meta-analysis of that and other techniques from 30 randomized trials of over 12,000 patients done by Jill Meyer and colleagues from Michigan at the time. So lateral versus sitting had an odds ratio of about 5.53. It cut it in half, um, as did fluid through the needle. So if you're an air person, put a little saline through the needle before you advance your catheter. Interestingly, single-hold catheters, rather than multi-orifice catheters, uh, also reduced intravascular placement, but the authors cautioned that that might be an artifact. That is, multi-hole catheters might just make it easier to know that you're in a blood vessel because there's more chances for blood to enter the catheter. The wire embedded soft urethane catheters, <coughs> excuse me, versus the nylon catheters had the greatest reduction in intravascular placement, about 85%. So those are a pretty good strategy, as is an older finding uh, that is, don't put the catheter in too far. Uh, three to five centimeters is enough. Greater than six is associated with a significant increase in intravascular catheters. So these are the six things we talked about. Uh, positioning, finding the right spot, which we're not very good at, anesthetizing the skin, use happy words, uh, identifying the epidural space, doesn't matter what you use, maybe there's some techniques coming that might improve it, probably use a soft uh, uh, urethane catheter with multiple holes, uh, and that will help you avoid intravascular placement. So to conclude, some established variations in technique and some future technologies um, may improve our already very admirable success rate. But it may be difficult to prove these with randomized trials because we all know what we're using. You can't blind. And of course, it's fans of the device that do the studies. Um, so it's going to be real world clinical experience from all of us that will really drive which one of these techniques we actually use. Thanks very much.